hope at least. Oh, here we go. We appear to be live in seven seconds ago. <laughs> I have two special guests today, and hopefully my audio setup works so we can hear them both. Uh, and we have here today uh, one Dennis Rimmer. Dennis, are you still there? Hey, how you doing? I'm calling from Radisson, Saskatchewan. And we also have uh, Sinos uh, Timon, if I'm pronouncing that right, who is the running for MLA here in Saskatoon Riversdale, Sinos. Are you still there? And did I get that one right? Still here, Jeb, and thank you for inviting me to this show. Actually, just a correction, I'm still running for the nomination to become a candidate for the NDP for the next provincial election. Oh, sorry. And you're, yeah. you're right. You haven't won yet. We're still working on that. I haven't won yet, so which is kind of a good week ahead of theirs. So. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. getting started. So, Dennis, you are an author, and you have a book that you have written that is available yeah, for purchase here in Saskatchewan, correct? And anywhere you want in the world online, Amazon.ca, or by mail by sending me a note. And we were in bookstores pretty much across the country, from St. John, New Brunswick, to White Rock, B.C., and Bellingham, Washington, and lots of libraries as well. And it's interesting that that gets brought up as far as the library is concerned, given I just finished uh, transcribing a whole bunch of notes from a history book about the history of the library system. But as far as the book itself, though, so what is this great Canadian notebook and what is it about and why uh, why this book? Why should we pick it up? Okay, it's, uh, yes, the great Canadian notebook. Uh, we, meaning my wife and I, came up with it in 2016, the summer of 2016. I can't believe it. That's four years ago. I thought it was just two years ago. And it's, everybody says, how long did it take to write? And I say, six weeks or 35 years. Because what the book is, a collection of columns that I have published in other media, like newspapers and online over the course of the years from 1986 up until 2016. So we put them all together and they're very short. I think the longest one is three or four pages, and some are like a half a page. But they're all little bite-sized bits of Canadiana, so that's why we call it the Great Canadian Notebook, because it's just uh, notes and quotes and a compendium, like I said, of Canadiana. A little stories, we talk about old Randy Backman from BTO and the Guess Who, and the people who used to be in broadcasting, Foster Hewitt, a town so called Poos Coupe. So, and, so uh, what would be one of those like that, stories, little. one of the little stories be? like? Not like the whole story, but just like a synopsis of one of the, the tales in this book. All right, talk about the big Canadian beer myth. For instance, all us Canadians think that our beer is so much stronger than U.S. beer, 
but uh, actually it depends on how you measure beer. And there was a time, and this is what I got in my research, um, from July 14th, 1923, the Vancouver Daily World newspaper had Cascade beer that was made in Vancouver. You could get it delivered free, and it was 8% by volume. You could buy it by the case and get free delivery. So that was when, yes, our beer was stronger, but... Uh, and that's, I that's think some 8% is pretty uh, strong for beer, I'd say. 8% is pretty strong for beer, yes. <laughs> and that's one of the examples. Another one is, well, my uncle, who fought in the Second World War, got wounded in Sicily, came home, started a family, and then fell victim to alcoholism, which also runs in my family. I talk about him. Talk about a local farmer out here in Radisson called uh, Old Dan. Sort of write about his life out here on the prairies as a bachelor farmer with horses and plows and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just uh, all sorts of stuff. Talk about Paderno uh, cookware, which is made in Canada, but it's in the White House apparently. Hmm. There's too many to talk about, but not enough to get you bored. So, Blue River, so, River, British Columbia. I've got one page on Blue River. So Dennis has been around in paying attention and soaking up these little bits and pieces of, of knowledge and stories and uh, political history for a long time now. And I was lucky enough to share a couple of drinks with him a good couple of months ago now. Uh, and I was very impressed with the background knowledge that you have. So it's kind of going from there. So Sinos, you're running for, or you're trying to get this position so that you can run for MLA. So starting right kind of at the top, why you? Why, why, what do you bring to the, the MLA role that the people in Saskatoon Riversdale would want? Let's start with that. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to start a little bit uh, with a little story, uh, if that would be okay. Sure, go for it. Nineteen years ago, uh, I landed here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, as an immigrant from war-torn country, Saskatchewan. And at that first time when I landed in Saskatoon, I got to meet one of these wonderful lady who helped us resettle and help us sort things around in Saskatoon as a newcomer, what to do, how to integrate to the community, learn about the Saskatchewan winter, how to dress women, all those stuff. So as this friend helped us get navigate our new home, adopted new home, we happened to discuss about Saskatoon general life in Saskatoon. And one thing that we talked at that time, as uh, indicated that, you know, I'm going to be visiting with you briefly, but I'm going to go through this meeting, which is about homelessness and, and, and housing. And I said, is there some people who are homeless here and people who uh, doesn't have food? And then she said, yes. So well, I didn't expect that at that time that really just got me understanding and learning that as Saskatchewan, what we have, knowing that there's people that are going without food, people that are struggling with homelessness, poverty and all that, that really hit me. As I start learning about Saskatchewan and the history, also I understand and start learning about the indigenous people. Their situation in the reserves where most of the living conditions are even far worse than the third world countries life. Those items really helped me to motivate me to get to understand about the Canadian uh, political system and about the political parties. And that really where led me to NDP. As I discover all those, find out that NDP is one of the parties that really shares my values of inclusiveness, justice and equity. And as at that time, I continue to be an advocate of, uh, in my community, in the community where I live in Middle Green area and all in Saskatoon about really those issues related to homelessness, poverty and so forth. So what do I bring to the table as an MLA? I believe that my lived experience in the community, I have seen so many people being left behind in Saskatoon Riversdale. So many people left behind, being children, going to school, hungry with parents struggling to find affordable housing and safe place to stay food seniors struggling without even not having enough to pay for their bills groceries the list goes on students who are struggling with student debt loads to make ends meet 
rising tuitions, all those things that really I have witnessed from every single day of life in Saskatoon on the west side. I believe that I have this lived experience that can help the NDP as we form a government in October to shape a policy or legislations that will help alleviate people from the issues of homelessness, poverty, housing, and all that, which most importantly really will be looking forward to champion initiatives like living wage, not only just talking about having minimum wage, but I believe that with having a living wage, people will advance and make a better lives for their families and be able to contribute to the communities that they live in. And this needs a champion who understand the issues in the neighborhood. And as a grassroots community leader that I live this and I understand I have this experience that I believe I can bring to the rivers that and champion those initiatives that really will elevate and improve the lives of seniors, homelessness and all children and everyone who lives in Saskatoon Rivers, including entrepreneurs. Saskatoon Rivers they'll be Come now uh, a nation of multiple nations where you can find all those people wanted to have their voice being heard and need to be represented and I have the ability to connect those people to help build our economy build our communities at the same time also help build our party to be the SAS party and win government in October all right so that's a pretty thorough answer on that one Dennis do you have any question or comment on that uh, yes, I'm just wondering, uh, let's get back to the bin beginning, uh, what uh, made you select Canada and Saskatoon in particular as a place that you would like to move to and continue your life? Thank you, Dennis. Well, I would say that uh, the time that we were in at that time was a disparate situation being displaced from your own home. We don't have a place to sleep. We don't have nothing to eat and all that. So we took a refugee in Egypt. And at that time, there wasn't really any options available. So Canada was the first country who came up and answered our hall that we have a space for you that we can take you and be part of Canada. So at that time, they gave us only one option that we were given really. The choices were made by the, by the immigration officials, by the citizens by immigration officials who make those decisions once they assess that we met the criteria to enter Canada, they said that, oh, you, know, you and your family will be going to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And at that time, even I never knew about just Saskatoon. Live on, I, I know Saskatchewan, but Saskatoon was really not in the radar at that time. I said, well, you know what? Well, it's, it, boy? it's pretty impressive that you would even know about Saskatchewan itself, right? I mean, that that's yes. pretty good. <laughs> yes. So, but the thing that I learned at that time when we are having the orientation telling us about life in Canada and Saskatoon, basically, the thing that they told us, you are going to the holiest place on earth, I said, what? I said, it's the coldest place on earth. I said, how cold it is? I said, well, the only way you can feel it is if you put your hand to your deep freezer, that's the only way you can feel how cold it is. But I cannot describe that. So that was pretty much uh, uh, interesting. So when I go here, I say, well, I'm going to move that place. I'm going to that coldest place on earth that is being described to me. I wanted to be there. And if I can survive there, that hole, then that's where I want it to be. So I'm so grateful for all the uh, opportunities opportunities that Canada has provided to me, uh, Saskatchewan and Saskatoon in particular. Uh, my wife and my our three children is enjoying living in Saskatoon, Middle Green, and enjoying our life here. And we are so grateful for the opportunities that we have. And I'm really looking for this opportunity to give back to my community, to the place that has given me a second chance of life. And that's really motivated me to get more into politics, to be able to give back in that way. As politics makes a lot, a lot of decisions that are happening that in our everyday life are made by politicians. And I believe that I have something to contribute also in that regard. So kind of starting from there, now we've, we've got this kind of a broad answer of why you, but I mean, it is a competition. And as much as we want to sometimes avoid thinking negatively about other people, especially people who are politically allied with us, you are in a competition for this position with one, at least Ashley Hicks. I, I haven't heard of any of the other competition yet. But as far as Ashley Hicks and you is concerned, why not Ashley? I mean, is there a difference between you that you can bring out why you and not her? Why me not her? Because I believe that I have the skills and passion to ensure that we all can do better. 
we all can do better and i have the ability to sow my grassroots that i can help build the ndp to get us in power in october of this year i have the connection in the community i have the understanding of the issues in the community i can champion those initiative based on the projects, based on my working relations with the indigenous people, with my working relations with the other ethnic communities, my work relations with the settlers and all that. I believe that I can be the bridge to retain this seat for the NDP in Saskatoon, Riversdale. Okay, uh, so Dennis, do you have any question on your side? Did we lose Dennis? Still there, Dennis. Okay. So, while well, Dennis is timing out, the so one question i've gotten from a couple of people is so based on your knowledge of the the west side and your contacts both in the indigenous community and elsewhere i've, I've gotten a lot of questions about people not feeling safe in their community people worrying about gangs people worrying about crime what from your perspective will you bring to the, the at least the provincial level as far as helping the Saskatoon West Side in its struggle with specifically the, the issue of gangs and just basic safety issues in that side. Thank you, Jeff, for that great question. I, I, I think, first of all, we need to ask the question, why are all these issues of gangs and violence only concentrated on the west side of the city or around the Pleasant Hill area or around the Middle Green area? We need to ask this question. The obvious answer here that we all know that this is rooted to the long persistent issues related to lack of support for families where a lot of people live in poverty, a lot of people felt left out, a lot of people left fell they don't get the support. So when people have that frustration, what else do you have? You don't have a hope for your life. You don't have a hope. What do these people have? People resulting to a violent way of life. People resulted in ways of being able to so find their own identity within the society that if the society rejected me, I think this is where I am and this is who I am and I can do this. So we need to get to the root cause of all this problem, which we all know, there's a lot of studies that have been done identifying those things. We need to get the roots and have a priority that we need to address the lack of affordable housing. We need to address poverty in that area. We need to address all these issues and come up with strategic plan to address this, whereby engaging all the stakeholders in the area to come up with a preventive strategy, not only reacting to a situation when things happen. And that will be the area that I'll be working very hard. Hopefully that the people of Saskatoon Rivers will give me the opportunity to campaign along our leader Ryan Mali. I'll be championing initiatives like that to bring a preventive strategic and address the root causes of the problem that really led people first of all to, to join gangs or become violent in the community. Kind of a good way to put it on that side. Now, one thing that was a specific detail that was asked uh, to me to bring up from one of my previous guests is apparently there's a, her group is a support group for crystal meth addicts. And she was wondering if you would commit to supporting, let's see if I can just get uh, her exact words here, quote, a safe house for crystal meth addicts that have landed up in the hospitals due to gang violence and overdose. And that basically to keep people from falling back into the grasp of the gangs. Is that something that would be kind of part of your strategy as you could see it? Or is that kind of too low level detail to be thinking about now without more consultation? I'll answer this with a little bit of short story. About last year, you remember, you probably did remember that I ran for the Saskatoon Center right. nomination. And at that time, I ran into this young man. When I was talking to him, we just conversation and then having all this about life and all that and then he indicated to me that you know, I'm grateful with what it is. I have made a bad choices in life and I went to jail and when I come back from there, I came back from jail, I came worse than when I went in. I knew that I made a mistake but I realized that being there it was not a right decision. It was not a right thing for me to be there because it didn't help me to change who I am. If I would have had another option, I think I would have been better than that. I know that I make a mistake. I deserve a punishment, but I would have been a better option. And that's exactly where coming to this is of this question. We need to understand that 
when people struggle, we need to have this opportunity for see, okay, if we are helping them right now, what's going to be the long term in order for them to be able to stay in the right path of progressing to overcome their past and move to the path that will help them be better and not fall back. And initiative as just this, the one that would support and put finance into it to make sure that what we are investing now is not going to actually cost us thousands of dollars down the road. We can spend $50,000 right now. Do you know what? If we don't have the preventive measures ahead, we're going to end up spending thousands of dollars more than that. Right, because, so, I mean, once, once exactly they get back into jail, yeah. the second yeah. time, so, like, it, it yeah, gets just, way more just, expensive. Just, just, and I'm just going to pause here for a moment. Uh, Dennis, are you still there? Uh, we lost you before. That's right, but actually the dinner bell has rung here in, in Radisson, so I'm going to have to depart. Oh, okay. But I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. Good luck to, to your other guest, to, uh, I don't want to mangle the name. I'm sorry about that. And if anybody wants more information, The Great Canadian Notebook, just go online, The Great Canadian Notebook. And good luck to everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Dennis. I'm going to disconnect you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Nice meeting you. All right. So, back to seeing us. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So with the longer term strategic level, this is going to be an expensive thing, short term, obviously not long term, but I can see it's the sort of thing that the SAS party is going to poke at and try to say, oh, you're just throwing money at these initiatives or the, the problem. How are you going to defend against accusations of people who are really just thinking on the short term level? and not interested in solving the big picture and the root causes of this. Because, I mean, I've spoken on the doorstep with a lot of people who don't see things that way. So how would you get through to them, and what would you say? Let me ask you this question, Jeff. Sure. These issues that now we are struggling with, how long has been this going on? I've been in Canada for 19 years, 20 years now. I've seen that problem still ongoing, and I believe it has been here for many years longer than that. With all these short-term picks, we continue to spend thousands of dollars every year for the same program eh, that we would have done better at first place to invest more money up front with a better outcome results. Right. And this is the same situation that we have with the First Nation Preserves. We just fix something smaller here and then at the long term, the problem proceeds lack of affordable housing, lack of clean water and all this and is causing the taxpayers a lot of money in the longer term. I believe that all the experts help us to understand what's the best approach to do this. It's a will from a government, it's a will from the politicians to understand that we need to embrace in order for us to get a better return and this all know that this can be done. Right. We have the resources, we have the resources, we have the ability to do so. It's a will of priority, it's, it's a matter of having our priority right. Are we actually taking care of our most vulnerable so that they can get them move forward or we're just on the after us who can actually take care of ourselves. Right. All right. That, that kind of makes sense. So uh, switching gears a little bit, as I'm sure you're well aware, we are in the midst of a global pandemic and Saskatchewan is still locked down. The SAS party is slowly opening the province back up again. And sort of a, a couple of quick things on this. Uh, I'll let you kind of choose how to respond to this. Uh, one, assuming that a vaccine becomes available, would you be willing to make it mandatory? And what under what conditions would it be mandatory? Uh, or, and then two, do you have any doctors informing your policy or your proposals at this point? Or are you waiting so that you get the nomination and then ideally getting into government and then getting access to the SHA's doctors for that purpose? Or have you gone ahead and already engaged with doctors or perhaps maybe even just Dr. Miley as your resident expert in medicine and medical related things? And then uh, on the third side, just like a general, what is your experience so far campaigning in this time of COVID? Well, I'll start on the top one here. It's very challenging, Jeff. I really last year before the COVID, I enjoyed my time at the doorsteps in Saskatoon Centre. I learned a lot. I enjoyed the interaction with members, asking questions, sharing their stories, and getting to know them at their doorsteps, and which I believe that is a key for us as a politicians to be having that interaction with the members, get to know each other. And that's the biggest challenge that I really miss at this time. It is a very challenging. I did reach out by phone, but it's not like 
when you are at doorsteps. But this is what it is right now. We try to do our best to connect with the members, and I hope that we will get over this together. It's a very unprecedented time, and once things are open up, we will resume our usual activities of connecting with members, engaging with them, and I'm really looking forward to that. I hope that the members of Saskatoon Rivers, they'll give me the opportunity to, to connect with them further at this. Yeah, and I'm just uh, going to pause there. So I was there. I wasn't literally on the doorstep with you, but I did get a chance to talk with some of the people who were and who were watching you and experiencing these kinds of conversations. And like you kind of put it, I mean, you're able to connect with people in a, in a really different way in person. And so like you were mentioning before we started, like you're, you're engaged in all these different community groups from the, the, the Meadow Green, the, the immigrant community, the refugee community, local church, and the Riversdale, there's a community group involved. You're in all of these different groups. and But all of these different groups are person-to-person -person groups, and they all involve this level of social interaction that is missing right now. <laughs> but like yeah. you say, we're all doing our best. So um, That's right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so that, moving to you. Okay, go moving ahead. To, yeah, moving to that response about the consultation with the doctors about this COVID. I'm so thankful to our leader, Ryan Marley. He has been showing a real leadership for a people for the Saskatchewan. He has been championing this, having these great ideas, despite the fact that the more disregarded many of his proposals that he put forward. But I'm so grateful that he is showing a leadership role that is really needed at this time. And I haven't engage with a lot of doctors in having that discussion because I believe that he as my leader is doing great job and to guide us in terms of medical expertise and the team with him is really doing a great job and I, I give them really uh, thanks a lot uh, to that. In terms of vaccine, you ask about vaccine when the vaccines are out, whether I can make it mandatory. Of course, of course, I believe that we all need protection. And the scientists and experts are doing their part to develop the vaccine to ensure that we all have access to the vaccine to the vaccine to protect ourselves and our loved ones. And I say is that this is gonna take all our collective responsibility to know that to fight this COVID is gonna require all us taking all the necessary precautions like what we are doing right now. Social distancing, washing our hands and doing all that. So that one's not gonna be any different than the vaccine. If you believe that you are immune to this, but probably your loved one is not immune to this. So do it for yourself and do it for others who are most vulnerable in our community. And that's really what I can say about that. Good way to put it. So switching gears a little bit, one of the issues that's come up and this includes in the NDP itself, is unlike previous elections here in Saskatchewan, at least from my perception, I've seen a lot of emphasis on making the, the political issue of the day a matter of excluding some other or some group and trying to circle the wagons, in a sense, around the group in particular. So I'll give an example of the NDP for, to start with. Uh, the SAS party, obviously, can we can pull example after example on. But there was a petition that went around. There was, a, from my understanding, an official NDP, provincial NDP petition trying to make a case for only for Saskatchewan jobs for, and again, I, I'm not going to go into the exact details, but it was from my side a little bit troubling to see because it seems like, I mean, this SAS party has a, a long history of this kind of policy, or, or at least this kind of like othering, whereas it seems like the NDP is starting to take a, a step or two in that direction. So as far as this upcoming election is concerned, what would you do to keep the NDP or the rest of the NDP from taking steps in this direction of kind of blaming our problems on people outside of Saskatchewan, etc.? And well, have, have, have you yeah. seen this at all? Yeah, thank you for that question. Again, I just wanted to say that our team current now and our leader, Ryan Marley, they're doing a great job in putting these policies together. And I think what we need to understand here that Saskatchewan residents come first in any policy that we do. That's my belief. That's my opinion. That's my belief and that's my opinion that I believe that anything, any policy that we do, Saskatchewan residents come first. And the interest of Saskatchewan comes first 
from us. And that's where the direction that we need to take as a party. And in my opinion, that's where it stands. It's no opinion against um, other others, but I think that's where a government should be doing, or as a politician. And hopefully that I get the opportunity, and that's where my stand would be. That's fair. But certainly you must see that in cases like that, just merely highlighting the uh, the question of who is the most important, who is the in-group that we want to defend here, can lead to situations like, for example, in, in this case of preventing workers from out of province, certain whatever minor class of workers from coming in. I mean, there is a level of, as a country, we, we have this, we already work together on a, a large scale. And although there are details like Tilma that certainly the NDP can work on and get, make more fair for the working people here in Saskatchewan, that there is this ability to come here and work that then enables the province to grow, enables more people to join our communities, etc. Do you see a risk of that being done in the name of Saskatchewan First rhetoric? I don't see it that way, really. I don't see it that way because what it is, is not, I might be wrong on this, but I'm not clear on this, but what I'm seeing here is that they stand for the NDP. They're not saying that we don't want an outside workers coming to Saskatchewan. That's not my understanding. They stand that, I believe, and even my sense is that we need to put Saskatchewan people first and we understand that all the things that we do as a province, there are going to be certain expertise. There are going to be certain things that we don't have. We're going to need to reach out to our brothers and sisters at the borders and way beyond our borders. And that's obviously, we are not closing the borders that no one coming to Saskatchewan to do something. But we need to make sure that any major projects, Saskatchewan residents, Saskatchewan companies, Saskatchewan entrepreneurs should be given the opportunity first because a lot of those entrepreneurs, they spend their money and everything stays in Saskatchewan. Okay. That's where my stand is, and I think that's the standard the NDP uh, stands on that side. It's not closing the borders completely that, no, we don't have to have people coming from other provinces working here, but at least we need to make sure that Saskatchewan entrepreneurs, Saskatchewan business and all that gets the opportunity considered in any major opportunities that comes around in the province that are being supported by tax fair dollars. That's totally fair. So one of the last questions here. So one of the political forces that has been created over the past election cycle is the Wexit and the people who are increasingly either afraid or worried about the influence of the federal government here in Saskatchewan. And so from your perspective, what can you or what do you offer to the people who may vote Wexit or may be leaning in that direction or are very skeptical of the federalism generally? Is your tent wide enough to include them or what would you say to them? I think what I can say here is that the history has shown us that we can do better together. And that's my stand that, and that's my belief that together we can do better and together we're stronger. Yes, we can agree, we can disagree in opinions and with other things, but NDP has a place for everyone. It's a party that is inclusive, a party that's open to opinions, and I believe that we have a space for everyone in Saskatchewan. That's really my take on that. Okay, so as a kind of closing thought, is there anything you'd like to say now that you've got the, the attention of the world, of the attention of the people in Saskatchewan, any last thoughts or any last statement that you'd like to make? First of all, I just want to say thank you, Jeff, for providing me the opportunity, for inviting me to be in this. So this is what I wanted to say to the residents of Saskatoon, Riversdale, and Saskatchewan. I've been out there. I heard a lot of stories of people struggling, seniors who wanted to live at home with their loved ones but there's no support. I heard from members in the community that we need to come together to build our province as we move forward. We are all Saskatchewan's. We have difference in opinions, we have all that, but we are all Saskatchewan's. This notion of rural versus urban, first nation versus settlers, settlers versus indigenous or immigrant and all this, this is not who we are. We are all Saskatchewan we all can do better when we come together. And I believe that I have the vision to help build our party. I have the passion to help build our economy and build bridges to bring all this community together to stand and fight for the better Saskatchewan that our children and our grandchildren 
will enjoy in the future. Also, to protect our Mother Earth. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity that Canada has given to me. And I look forward to give back as a member of Legislative Assembly for Saskatoon Riversdale. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating today. And just a reminder for those of you who are listening, you can support this weekly broadcast by going to subscribestar.com slash jeff dash cliff apparently i've been pronouncing it wrong this whole time it's not subscriber star it's subscribe star so please do consider that because uh it does make it easier for me to pay rent etc so um one quick thing jeff if i don't mind sure go for it yeah i just wanted to remind the listener there if you are a member of the saskatchewan ndp in riversdale the voting will be closing tomorrow at 5 p.m. If you have not casted your vote, please go online. You should check your emails or call to cast your vote. And I hope you can support me. And thank you. And more to that effect, because thank you for reminding me of that, the website to join the Saskatchewan NDP is saskndp.ca. Apparently you can join right on their website and possibly even vote after you do that. So give it a thought and hopefully we'll see you all next week.